You might have heard recently some chatter about the great observatories that NASA has launched. So what's up with that? Congress is about to make a huge mistake in space. Chandra X-ray Observatory is under threat of being significantly cut. If Congress approves this budget, layoffs could start this summer with the telescope shutting down shortly after that. And without a replacement, losing Chandra would be what scientists are calling an extinction level event for X-ray astronomy. Uh, we'd always known that if telescopes are ground-based, that we're limited by not only the transparency of the atmosphere, depends on what wavelength of light you're looking in, but also on turbulence within the atmosphere that could disrupt the precision and sharpness of the images you seek. And so shortly after the Second World War, there's a an astrophysicist named Lyman Spitzer, who suggested, you know, with this new rocket technology that the Nazis used in their war effort, this technology granted by the V-2 rocket. V-2 rocket is basically the first intercontinental ballistic missile. The V-2 rocket leaves the atmosphere and then re-enters with a warhead, okay? So it's a weaponized version of what a rocket would be or would become. But once you realize if it's a rocket that can take you out of Earth's atmosphere, then that rocket can do other things for you. Werner von Braun, the mastermind behind the V2 rocket, famously said when asked, was the V2 program successful? He replied, yes, it was successful. The problem was, they landed on the wrong planet. That was his sort of backhanded way of saying, we really want to use this technology to explore, to explore space, to go beyond Earth's atmosphere. Lyman Spitzer, professor of astrophysics at Princeton University, who I got to know while I was there before he died, uh, suggested this, wrote a research paper on it. Doing what? Taking a telescope that would otherwise function on Earth and putting it into orbit above Earth's atmosphere. And that way, you're not limited by clouds. You're not limited by anything. You're not even limited by nighttime. Because even in the day, what lightens up your day is not only the direct sunlight, if you're looking at the sun, but the rest of the atmosphere is illuminating the day. And that's scattered sunlight from the sun. But if there is no atmosphere, there's nothing to scatter it. He says, let's put a telescope in orbit. And it was kind of remote. We didn't have the engineering to do it. We knew it would work. The physics of it would work. The engineering of that would take a very long time to figure out. Plus, we had to have the Cold War because that put money into space investments. Sputnik had to get along. All this had to happen. And finally, we figured out, yes, we can put a great observatory into orbit. And that was the Hubble Space Telescope. We all think it should have been named after Spitzer. But Spitzer was alive at the time. And it is our tradition to not name telescopes after living people. And so it was named after Edwin Hubble, in part because of the questions it was designed to answer, such as what is the expansion rate of the universe? And from that, we would then derive its age. And Hubble was the first to show that the galaxies, as they recede from us, give us an indication of the expansion of the universe and the age. So it was sensibly named after him, Edwin Hubble. And he did that work 100 years ago in the 1920s. So the Hubble Space Telescope was unique among space-borne telescopes because it was deployed out of the payload bay of the space shuttle. So this is the orbiter this top part, the re this whole assembly is the space shuttle assembly, but the part with wings, that's what we call the orbiter. Once that's in orbit, it can deploy satellites, it can retrieve satellites. Why is that important? Because you can go back to the telescope and service it. Something goes wrong, there's technology that improves. It, provided you designed it modularly in the first place, you can then improve on it 
later. And that's exactly what we did with the Hubble telescope. Hubble was launched in 1990, early 90s, when it came online. And we are now more than 30 years later, and it is still getting data. Part of why it's still getting data is because we serviced it five times. We went up there, we swapped out the, the, the circuit boards, the, the solar panels, we even fixed the lens. The lens had some issues, then that, that, the mirrors. The mirror was designed to the wrong focus, and we fixed that, gave it a pair of corrective lenses for it. And in the early 1990s, people started getting email accounts, the internet was becoming available, the telescope is entirely digital, so it was perfectly timed for the public to embrace all that it could drink in from the universe. Hubble images of stupefying beauty were people's screensavers for their computers. It was their, the wallpaper they used. It was shared among people via the internet at a time the internet for everyone was a brand new uh, pathway to communicate. Hubble telescope was specifically tuned to view visible light. So what it saw is what we would see if our eyeballs were big enough, or what our retinas would see. In a sense, the Hubble telescope was an extension of ourselves in orbit around Earth, looking out to the farthest reaches of space. This is one of multiple great observatories that were launched. Hubble is just the visible part of the spectrum. The universe isn't limited to talking to us with visible light. No, no, what's visible light? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet but there are other bands of light that are coming to us from the universe. And that includes infrared, ultraviolet, X-rays, gamma rays. These are entire bands of the electromagnetic spectrum, which we call light, only some of which is visible. We have the knowledge, we have the engineering, we have the funding to build other great observatories looking through these other windows in the electromagnetic spectrum. Hubble was visible light, all good, okay? Then we had an infrared telescope, another great observatory launched into orbit. Finally, we would name that after Lyman Spitzer, because by then he had died. Lyman Spitzer got a telescope named after him. It was a, one of the great observatories, it was infrared. We would also have an X-ray telescope an X-ray telescope named after a brilliant uh, astrophysicist named Subrahmanyan Chandrasekhar, affectionately known by his loved ones and friends as just Chandra. We built an X-ray telescope specializing in that bandpass of the electromagnetic spectrum, named it after him. That went gangbusters, because what gives us X-rays in the universe? black holes dining upon stars and gas clouds that have wandered too close. It strips the matter, flays the stars, and the material spirals in, and it heats up. It becomes so hot, it's not only glowing red hot, it glows white hot, it glows blue hot. It is so hot, it is radiating X-rays. The Chandra telescope enables us to see parts of the universe where very high energy activity is unfolding. There was another great observatory, Compton, named after Arthur Compton, a great physicist. And this specialized in gamma rays. Gamma rays. Each of these telescopes uses very specialized detectors because you can't just take one detector and use it for a different band of light in the spectrum. This opened up the universe to us. This enabled, it empowered the United States community of astrophysicists to lead the world in our understanding of the universe as communicated to us from the universe via these windows on the cosmos. These are the grand observatories. So what do you do as they age? You, you wanna, and you're ready to sort of turn them off, you wanna bring in a replacement telescope so you can continue your access to that part of the universe, to that bandwidth of the universe. And so the James Webb Space Telescope not only can view optical wavelengths, but it's tuned for infrared. So in a way, that's like the follow-on telescope from Spitzer, from the Spitzer Telescope. The Hubble Telescope, there's a uh, Nancy Grace Roman Telescope, which is tuned for visible light, which will be 
getting data on large swaths of the universe. Hubble was very narrow uh, points, a very narrow field of view looking out to the cosmos. Um, the Nancy Grace Roman telescope would be wide field of view. So these are telescopes as we continue to march into ever, ever deeper questions about the operations of nature on the largest scale. There's one telescope that we don't have a replacement for right now, and that's the Chandra telescope. Uh, that one is about to be decommissioned, and we've got nothing to replace it. So that will be a window to the universe that will just shut down until someone, some country, if not the United States, somewhere where they say, we want to continue to understand what the X-ray universe looks like, and then go ahead and send one of those telescopes into orbit. By the way, the X-rays and gamma rays don't make it to Earth's surface, so you need the telescopes in orbit for that. So this is just an overview on the great observatories uh, of our times. And there's some politics behind it and funding sources. And oh, by the way, we were about not to give the fifth servicing mission to Hubble. You know what happened? The public rose up and said, we want more Hubble. And Congress, who is a servant of the public, ostensibly, said, we will fund a fifth servicing mission for Hubble. And that's exactly what they did, prolonging the life of Hubble even further. Uh, Chandra had, maybe it's not as popular, didn't have the legacy that Hubble did, that the Hubble telescope did, having with whole generations of people who grew up with such images. So yeah, science doesn't always follow the path where science most needs it. And so I, I'm, I'm more an observer of it than one who's just trying to wrestle people to fund one thing or another. So I just thought I'd share with you a slice of what we encounter as scientists on the frontier. There are those who are comfortable with pencil and paper, the theorists, maybe a computer, of course. But if you're an observer, an experimentalist, your life flows through the capacity of these new waves of equipment, detectors, telescopes to take you that very next step. And uh, it doesn't always go the way we want. So that's, that's what's up with that. Until next time, keep looking up.